welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for our second live from outside webinar. We are joined today by an incredible panel. Uh, Dustin Schrock, who you see on video, is the interpretive ranger at Caddo and Atlanta State Parks. He will also be joined by Laura Ashley Overdyke, executive director, Catholic Institute, and Tim Bister, the district fisheries biologist with Parks and Wildlife. So you all have noticed there is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. That is a great way for you to connect with us. There'll be a couple opportunities to ask questions during the program and then also ask questions at the end. So please use that Q&A. We would love to hear from you, comments, questions. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ranger Dustin. Well, howdy folks. I'd like to give you all a big Texas welcome over here at Cattle Lake State Park. Uh, we are gonna be talking today about, if I can get my stuff to work here, Cattle Lake Adventure Conservation and Paddlefish. Uh, we're going to structure this, uh, like she said, we're going we're to have this presentation. There'll be a couple of chances to ask questions. Uh, we're going to have a couple of videos of me interviewing uh, Laura Ashley and Tim Bister. So after those videos, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the, the box and we'll get some of those answered. Let's get started. So where is Caddo Lake? So if you have not, uh, if you're not from Texas, um, or if you've never been to the east side of Texas, we are located in the northeast part of Texas. We're at the Oklahoma, Arkansas, East Texas, and Louisiana uh, area. Uh, so if you were, let's say you were in Houston, uh, you could hop on 59 and go north, all the way up into the Marshall area. And we're located just outside of Marshall and Jefferson. If you were uh, in the, say, Dallas Fort Worth area, you could hop on I 20. And head east. If you're all the way over in West Texas, uh, it's going to be a bit of a drive, but we're happy to have you. Just take that straight line all the way across. Now you'll notice here on the right hand side, I've got a picture of Caddo Lake. Uh, on it, you're going to see Caddo Lake State Park. You're going to see the Caddo Lake uh, WMA or Wildlife Management Area. Uh, and you're going to see the uh, Caddo Lake National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, that's run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the Cadillac Cattle State Park is actually located two river miles, uh, maybe three down uh, from, uh, from the lake, as you can see on the map. Uh, but we, we do have access. So this is some pictures of Cadillac State Park. It's where I work. I'm happy to share this with you. We, uh, we are a CCC park, or the Civilian Conservation Corps. We were built uh, between 1934 and 1937. Uh, by the CCC and opened July 4th. Um, we have access to canoes, cabins, uh, camping, so tent camping, RV camping. We have over two miles of trails. And uh, this is a pretty cool place. So I like to say that it's a jumping off point for adventure. And what that means is we, uh, though we are, you know, 550 acres, uh, it's kind of a small park, you might think, but we have access to, uh, we give access to over 51 miles of paddling trails. So that's canoeing, canoeing kayaking, uh, stand up paddleboard. And uh, the lake is 25,000 acres, but within that are thousands of acres of public land. So there's the WMA, the Wilderness Management Area run by Texas Parks and Wildlife. And there's also the, the refuge. And those, so together you have quite a bit of opportunities. Um, how you might have often heard that Caddo Lake is the only naturally formed lake in Texas. This is true. Uh, so about 80 miles of uprooted trees and river, uh, piled up into the river. Now, when that happens, uh, when a tree falls into the river, uh, it's bringing with it all of that sediment, the roots, the leaves, the limbs and debris, and it's, it's piling up. And when this happened uh, on the uh, Louisiana side, the Red River, uh, it backed up over 80 miles of uprooted trees uh, and created a, a sort of raft and disrupted the river flow. When this happened, the, the water backed up into the uh, Cypress Basin and Caddo Lake was created around 1800. Um, the lake is named after the Caddo people. 
the Caddo Nation, and they were a uh, uh, they they are a very uh, socially complex society. Uh, at the time, they were a, a group of three major groups uh, with over 27 smaller tribes, very diplomatic, agriculturally based people, and uh, they are where we get the namesake for the Caddo Lake. But it is also thought that we get uh, the name Texas from Caddo. So they had the name Texas, which was adapted by the Spanish, uh, adopted by the Spanish, excuse me. And then we adopted uh, Texas from Texas from the Spanish, so pretty cool. So what are wetlands? In the back here, you can see there's this mysterious picture with fog on the water. Uh, sometimes wetlands might seem like they're inaccessible or that they're scary. Uh, they are, very, very special uh, because they're very rare. Um, they are land areas that are covered by water for all or part of the year. Uh, they, so if you've ever, you know, you have marshes, river channels, ponds, lakes, streams, these are all wetlands, uh, swamps too. And they act like giant sponges that trap and filter the water. Uh, they slow flooding and erosion and store clean water by trapping pollution um, and they also create feeding and spawning areas for fish. Well, I want you to think about how we interact with these. So we have uh, our wetlands for boating purposes, fishing. Sometimes people put their, their homes on rivers and lakes. Uh, and when that happens, when we interact with these, these wetlands, we have to be careful that we're not changing them. Uh, sometimes if we put in a home on a lake, we might cut off that bank and we might divert water to other places. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're being cautious when we interact with our wetlands. So some of the, uh, we have quite a bit of wildlife here at Caddo Lake. Um, so we have over 212 species of birds, 55 kinds of mammals, uh, 90 species of amphibians and reptiles, over 90 species of fish swimming the lake and surrounding waters. Uh, I personally have, uh, it's not a phobia, I guess I would say, but I, I've always been a little bit cautious of snakes, and you should be, uh, but they are, uh, they are crucial to the survival of these wetlands. If you imagine that we got all, rid of all of our snakes all at once, we might have too many of another type of animal, and then our wetlands would be out of bounds. Same with the alligators. Uh, the alligators out here don't actually like to be around humans, so if you want to see them, you have to be very quiet and cautious. Uh, that's, that's the case with most of these animals that you're going to find out here. Uh, if you will approach uh, these areas quietly and calmly, you have a higher chance of seeing some of the cool things we have out here. So in the upper corner, you'll notice I'll have, we have an American alligator, we have a barred owl, an egret, and a hognose snake. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get into the interview. Uh, that I did with Laura Ashley. Uh, if you have any questions, please wait until after the video and we'll see if we can get her to answer it to you. And Dustin, if you can boost the audio or double check that the audio is playing, you can see y'all clearly, but can't hear. So I have it playing. Um, I don't know if that's going to act like a secondary sh sharing. Um, yeah, I've got my, my audio cranked all the way. What? I might recommend that you take yourself off video to loosen the draw on the internet and then try to just run the video. <laughs> and Dustin, something you can do is if you um, when you screen share, there's an option to share computer audio. And so okay. double check if that's clipped and that should hopefully solve the problem. Let's go and stop the share for a second. Um, so how would I go to share the audio? Yeah, so when you click on share screen, there mm -hmm. is an option along the bottom of that pop-up box that's uh, uh, share sound there it is okay cool <laughs> i'm so glad that you're here hey well we're glad you're here i'm excited to see this video all right can you guys see that 
It's coming up. There we go. That about how you found conservation, why Cattle Lake is so special to you, and what your institution does. Okay. Well, we are certainly at one of the most beautiful places in the world, and uh, I don't know who has the better job, getting to be an interpreter at Caddy Lake State Park and be out here all the time, or the fact that I run the Caddy Lake Institute and get to um, be part of conserving this amazing habitat for generations to come. So I grew up uh, going to Caddy Lake starting when I was about five years old, swimming, fishing, hunting, water skiing, and um, it just gets in your bones and you love it forever. So I kept coming back to Caddo uh, on a really regular basis for decades. I moved away um, and when I came home, um, the Caddo Lake Institute uh, had already been around for decades oh, okay. and um, was looking for a new executive director. And so I'm glad to get to do fundraising and to liaise with all levels of local government, uh, state government, federal government, to try and bring resources to bear on Caddo Lake um, to meet its most pressing challenges. That's awesome. Well, why don't you go ahead and tell me um, kind of what the value of wetlands are and the services they provide to people. Um, you were mentioning about how this is a, a big part of our communities and it's, it's very important uh, for both uh, the ecosystems, uh, for, as far as the animals are concerned, the plants, but also for the humans. You know, I can kind of understand why swamps uh, don't get a lot of credit and um, often weren't seen as very productive land, so were drained or filled in. Um, and actually, wetlands are very productive. Uh, at least a third of our plant and animal species live in wetlands. Uh, even though wetlands only cover 5% of the earth. So the fact that this wow. tiny amount uh, of concentration of 5% of the earth being wetlands and yet having something to do with the life cycle of at least a third of plant and animal species, they're very productive ecosystems and they hold a lot of biodiversity. You know, they also hold floodwaters. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a great place uh, for floodwaters to be held the water then will slowly percolate down and recharge the groundwater. So they purify uh, potential drinking water for people in the future um, through groundwater recharge. And they provide a lot of recreation. So around here, it's one of the primary drivers of the economy is the recreation um, that's done on and around the lake and the small cottage industry of tourism that's built up to supply the hunters and fishermen and photographers and birders right. and campers uh, and hikers with all their supplies. So um, they provide a lot of services for nature and for us. They can even, wetland soils are holding a lot of carbon and old growth forests are holding a lot of carbon. We haven't done as good a job yet of quantifying um, freshwater wetlands or old growth hardwoods mm -hmm. for their carbon storage potential. But um, we know from various studies that they are holding a lot. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna ask you about something that I just learned about, uh, just a little bit, which I wouldn't have done had we not had this interview, but why don't you tell me what uh, Ramsar Wetlands of International Importance are and how uh, Cattle Lake got that designation? So because the world was losing wetlands um, at a rate higher than forest, so wetlands were disappearing uh, as the primary type of habitat that was disappearing. I guess with forest, uh, as some are cleared, others are planted, but with wetlands, as they're destroyed, no new ones were being created. So in 1971, um, the UN recognized the value of wetlands and wanted to do something to highlight wetlands that had a lot of value to the world. So they came up with a treaty in 1971 in uh, a town called Ramsar. And so this is where they decided to begin honoring uh, different wetlands around the world that qualified uh, at the highest level of habitat and value, irreplaceable habitat. Sure. So to be a Ramsar wetland of international importance means this is irreplaceable habitat that has value um, for the whole world. So wow. because of the number of birds um, that migrate through Caddo, because of um, certain types of ducks who breed here more than anywhere else, and um, just the incredible amount of species diversity. 973 different species have been documented 
at Caddo. So um, that was recognized by Ramsar as Texas's only wetland of international importance. Our only wetland of importance. There is one wow. wetland of international importance in Texas, and this is it. Awesome. There's also one natural lake in Texas, and this is it. Okay. Every other lake in Texas is a reservoir that was man-made. So um, it's a very special place, uh, not just for Texas, but for the United States and the world. So um, that Ramsar designation really helped a lot of uh, local people realize what a special mm -hmm. thing they had in their own backyard. And um, it wasn't just the UN that noticed this, the US Fish and Wildlife Service has, has said that Caddo is um, priority one habitat, again, irreplaceable, and so has the highest priority uh, in the federal government as well, in terms of uh, the bottomland hardwoods, the wetlands, and the species diversity. Okay, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot to unpack. Um, so we've we've established how special this place is, uh, but how are we, how are we keeping it special? How are we restoring some of these habitats? Um, and, and how can uh, communities kind of get involved? Well, you know, Caddo is pretty uh, intricate. It's not just one type of habitat. So there's um, a large river, um, which we call Big Cypress Bayou. Uh, it could be called the Cypress River. And there are smaller tributaries, some of which are only seasonally flooded. Then there are low-lying swamp lands, and then there's open lake. So all of that is surrounded by lots of old growth bottomland hardwoods and even some uplands and mixed pine savanna. So I think that um, when you're looking at such an intricate habitat that's all connected, um, it can be easy to zoom in and focus on just one species mm -hmm. or one thing, but if you step back and look at the thousands, tens of thousands of acres of all these different types of habitat that are home to great birds that we get to hear right now, um, the, the single biggest thing we could do to impact the health of this is water. 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 The right amount of water at the right time. Okay. So each piece of that habitat puzzle requires water at the right time in the right amount. Challenge is, uh, since Texas didn't have any lakes, they um, dammed up Big Cypress Bayou to create Lake of the Pines. Um, and that happened in the late 1950s. So what used to have a very seasonal flow of water, mm -hmm. lots of water in the springtime, flooding of the bottomland hardwoods. Um, those floods would connect some oxbows back to the main body of sure. water. So the fish that were spawning in the little oxbows would then get back into the main channel and populations of fish would mix. Um, the bottomlands would get enough moisture that they needed to survive. And then in different parts of the year, there would be dry times. Uh -huh. And in dry times, uh, new cypress trees could be born because mm -hmm. they can't, they can survive in water, but they can't start can't take in water. water. Right. So they've got to have some dry ground to get new cypress trees. Um, the dry times also can kill some invasive species that would get stranded on the banks and dry out. Okay. And so the dry times have their function too. The dam goes in and the variability stops. Overnight overnight. It goes from a seasonably variable system for millennia to uh, no variability overnight. Wow. And that caused um, some die-off of hardwoods in the bottomlands. Mm -hmm. It caused some oxbows to be disconnected from the rest of the system. It caused sediment to build up on the bottom uh, where there used to be scouring flows of water to clean off sediment. So spawning gravel beds where fish might lay their eggs were now too gunky to, oh, wow. to hold those eggs. Mm -hmm. So the water quality was also going in the wrong direction with uh, pH was going in the wrong direction, dissolved oxygen was going in the wrong direction, and some species completely disappeared 
because of the lack of variable flow. Is the paddlefish one of those? The paddlefish disappeared in the mid-1970s from okay. Caddo Lake, and the state of Texas declared it a state-threatened species. Wow. So uh, by the time I got to Caddo in 81, there were no paddlefish here. Oh, wow. And I didn't know about them until I got this job, and now the more I learn about them, the more amazed I am. Uh, and we'll get to talk about the paddlefish, and I, I hope lots of people will talk to you about the paddlefish, because they're amazing. Sure. Um, so they were extirpated from their native range because they didn't have the seasonal flow to tell them it was time to spawn and they didn't have a gravel bottom where they could lay their eggs sure okay. so we stepped back we looked at the overall system and we realized that the number one thing we could do was to restore some variability mm -hmm. and in 2004 we started working with many scientists from different universities and the Nature Conservancy of Texas, who has a great sustainable rivers program, to engage with the Corps of Engineers, who operates the Lake of the Pines Dam upstream, and say, okay, if we want to inject some variability back into the system, if we want to mimic Mother Nature, and we want to um, provide the water at the right time in the right amount for these different functions, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. Um, it took a decade of hundreds of scientists and government agencies working together to come up with a flow regime, is what we call it, okay. um, that would provide, you know, every few years you need a big scouring flow, sure. each year you need some base maintenance flows, um, from time to time you need an overbank flow. Mm -hmm. um, and so that prescription was tweaked over the years and tested. Uh, and then the Corps of Engineers agreed to uh, voluntarily try this out. Okay. So we also had to have a partnership with the people who own the water in Lake of the Pines, which is the Northeast Texas Municipal Water District, because they can sell water to cities and industry. Mm -hmm. And um, they were very much on board to say, that uh, there needed to be a balance, that we could balance what the cities and people needed and what industry needed with what nature needed. Okay. Um, so working with the Corps of Engineers, Northeast Texas Municipal Water District and the Nature Conservancy, the Caddo Lake Institute um, is proud to say that now this flow regime is part of the operations manual at Lake of the Pines Dam. Mm -hmm. And so for the past eight years, flows have been released at the right time in the right amount um, to give fish that signal to spawn, mm -hmm. to scour the bottom, to improve the water quality, and to keep the bottomland hardwoods forests healthy. That's awesome. That's so exciting to hear. And it sounds like it takes uh, not just government agencies, but it takes the public, it takes uh, private corporations, everybody needs to get involved. Um, one could say it takes a village. It takes a lot of moving parts. It takes persistence and coordination and collaboration. Um, the local people um, have been very supportive of these efforts. Mm -hmm. And so for the Corps of Engineers to take any further steps uh, in looking at what more can be done um, to restore this area through their tools that we have, mm -hmm. um, we're going to need local support. Sure. from uh, local stakeholders and elected officials to work with the core. Um, it's gonna take an act of Congress oh, wow. to get a new start feasibility study um, mm -hmm. to kind of take this project to the next level. Okay. And um, we would like for the core to initiate this feasibility study, which is a three-year maximum study um, of the whole system to understand what we could do better and um, it's going to take some time sure. and <laughs> all good things do and and community support so okay. uh, I think that you know elected officials may not hear from people who love to come to state parks or go hiking or spend time out in nature mm -hmm. how much that means to them uh, and it's really helpful for them to know that um, their constituents have place value, great value on being able to spend time uh, in the great outdoors. 
uh, I think, you know, paying fees to enter a state park, which are very reasonable fees and uh, hunting and fishing licenses, you know, all of this supports uh, conservation work. Okay. So that's what local people can do. They can also uh, try to, you know, reduce their own water consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on a small scale. The residential water consumption in this area is not um, very problematic to be careful about how they're applying um, fertilizer, mm -hmm. especially near bodies of water. So to make sure they're way back uh, away from drainages, creeks, streams, and the water so that there's some buffer uh, and only use as much um, fertilizer as they need. Okay. Uh, that has been a problem for us at various points. Too much phosphorus in the system and that's a lake limiting uh, chemical. So the public can help us in that way as well. Awesome. Well, Laura, Ashley, I appreciate all of your time. Thank you for this wonderful insight into both the Cattle Lake Institute, Cattle Lake, and how the community can get involved. I really appreciate it. Okay, well, two things, guys. I completely forgot how uh, uh, embarrassing it is to see yourself on camera asking questions, so that was fun. But I also forgot how informative uh, Laura Ashley was in the interview. That's really awesome. We have her here right now. Uh, so if uh, you want, Laura Ashley, you can uh, answer any questions. Uh, Louisa, do we have any in the, the box? No, but now's a great time to open it up. So if you have any questions for Laura Ashley, who's with us, please type them into the Q&A. We'll read them out loud and just chat more about this amazing creature and Cattle Lake. And Laura Ashley, if you would like to, I know that you are um, able to come on camera. We can bring you on so that you can answer our first question that says, what is your favorite function of a wetland? Well, I think that the, the water level changes pretty dramatically out at Caddo. Like right now it's really quite quite low. Um, and so we can see more of the cypress knees that are that are showing out of the water. Um, but I think it's the birds that really make Caddy Lake so special to me. And some of them thrive exclusively in that wetland and like to build their nests with the Spanish moss. So, um, you know, they're eating fish and bugs that are attracted to that uh, very moist area and using the local Spanish moss uh, to build their nests. So um, I think that the home for birds is, is my favorite function of it. Um, and I, I do appreciate that the flood potential, uh, the potential of holding flood waters, which it does, really does matter for a lot of people downstream and in the surrounding areas. So that's pretty significant for people as well. It was wonderful to hear those birds in your interview as well. <laughs> um, another question is, have you reintroduced the paddlefish and have the paddlefish started spawning again? Really good question. Um, a few paddlefish have been put in uh, as long ago as, seven or eight years ago, but the larger numbers um, started to be reintroduced in 2018. But the paddlefish doesn't reach sexual maturity until they're six, seven, eight years old. So we have not yet had a chance to see if they're gonna spawn on their own. Uh, within the next year, uh, we'll really be looking at some gravel spawning beds and seeing if the mature uh, paddlefish are returning to those um, spawning beds. They have trans acoustic transmitters in, in many of them, so they can be tracked. And uh, they're just getting old enough to start reproducing on their own. We don't know yet. Question, the START study, what is the status? To get a new START um, through the Corps of Engineers, um, the Corps of Engineers looks at these new starts every two years. Uh, they just finished one uh, called WERDA, 
Water Resource uh, Development Act. And so it would be another two years um, before Caddo Lake, the Cypress River Basin could be included as a new start study. It requires, um, it requires US senators uh, from Texas knowing that the public cares um, about this very much and that they wanna see Caddo saved and that they want us to continue um, the good work that we've been doing. So it really is going to take um, a grassroots effort to influence um, elected officials at the DC level, at the federal level um, to move that forward. So it's really um, coalition building at this point and working with the Corps of Engineers just to make sure that there's no way we can do this without an act of Congress, because it's not a very sure bet. What more needs to be done to the ecosystem, i.e., why did you request the feasibility study? Well, these um, releases are currently voluntary. <laughs> uh, it is in the operations manual at the Lake of the Pine Stand, but it's not permanent. It also, our recommendations haven't been fully adopted with the Texas um, with TCEQ. And uh, we do still have questions about uh, in the future, um, as we expect more dramatic rain events to occur, um, more rain falling in a short period of time and then long periods without any rain at all. We're trying to see if the Lake of the Pines Dam, uh, Lake of the Pines Reservoir could hold more water. Um, it holds a certain level seasonally right now and then drops down for the rest of the year. We're curious, could it hold that seasonal level all year so that we would have um, extra to play with in case of drought? And that seems to require a new start feasibility study to, um, to store more water in that Corps of Engineers reservoir. And that was our last question, but we do have a comment. I don't have a question, but it was really informative and I enjoyed the presentation. So did I. Thank you so much, Laura Ashley. Enjoy it. You'll enjoy Cali Lake even more. Come and see us. Thank you, Laura Ashley. Uh, and thank you for those questions. Next, we're going to go ahead and hear from Tim, Tim Bister. And again, once we're done, go ahead and put those questions in the box and we'll go ahead and get them answered. Well, Tim Bister, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. I'm, uh, I'm real excited about this, this, this webinar we're doing. It's about Caddo Lake. Um, you are a, a wildlife biologist? I'm a fisheries biologist. Oh, a fisheries biologist. Okay. Well, that's cool. I'm glad you're here. Um, get, get some kind of input from, from your expertise in the area. Uh, so why don't you start off by telling us how you got into being uh, a biologist with TBWD uh, into fisheries and what, what that kind of entails. Sure. So, so I am a uh, fisheries management biologist. My job is to manage um, basically sport fish populations for people that like to go fishing. You know, basically my job is to make fishing better. And I, I grew up fishing. I, I loved fish, loved the outdoors. And um, when I was getting ready to go to school, it's like, what, what could I do? You know, and w one of the things I uh, first looked into was being a, a, a deer biologist. And I'm from Connecticut originally, and I called the, the deer biologist in the state and he said, you don't want to do that. There's only, there's only two biologists in the whole state. Well, right. Connecticut's a pretty small state. So Texas has a lot more biologists than that. Right. But that discouraged me there, but I like to fish too. So I, I talked to uh, one of the fisheries professors at the University of Connecticut. He mm -hmm. said, yeah, this is great. This is what you need to do. And started me on, on my path there. Um, got my bachelor's degree in, in uh, natural resources at the University of Connecticut. Went on for my master's degree in fisheries science from South Dakota State University. Okay. And uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife was the first place to give me a job getting out of grad school. That's awesome, I'm glad to hear that. Well, what is, uh, what is your job here in the area? What, 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 is, uh, what does it look like for you? What does a day look like for you? So uh, one of the neat, neat things about my job is it changes throughout the year depending on what season it is. Okay. You know, one of our main uh, focuses in the, in the fisheries district is to manage the, the fish populations. And we do that by doing uh, 
fish population surveys. Mm -hmm. In the fall, we uh, conduct the electro fishing surveys where we actually put electricity into the water and it stuns the fish. We're able to capture the fish, count how many there are, Whoa. see how long they are, and um, see the different types of species and, and how healthy the population is. Okay. Uh, in the spring, we do some netting for some different species. So the, the different gears that we use to collect fish are, um, some are effective for some kind of fish and, and others are uh, more effective for, for different species. So that's why we do a, a mix of things. Uh, another thing that we do is we go out and we talk to anglers. We mm -hmm. do angler surveys. Um, I just uh, did one this past Saturday on, on Caddo talking to people fishing. There was a lot of people fishing, but it was, uh, it was a rough day, not too many people catching, but it's sure. still a good day to be out there. Um, and then another thing that we do is uh, fisheries habitat management. Mm -hmm. Habitat's important for, for fish, so we look at improving habitat or um, manipulating habitat that may be detrimental to, to fish. Okay. So that plus a, a lot of outreach events trying to uh, get kids fishing. Working uh, with the community. Sure, and cool. working with the community a lot um, throughout throughout the district. Okay. Uh, our district uh, is the northeast corner of the state and there's there's 14 districts throughout the state of Texas just like mine. Okay, very cool. Well, we're talking about fish. Uh, I would love to hear more about the paddlefish. Laura Ashley uh, talked a little bit about it, but I know that you have a lot of experience with the paddlefish. But the, the paddlefish restoration project is, is very interesting and, and we're really excited to be involved with it. Um, it's a project that's being led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, but our involvement as a partner with the project has been really great. Uh, it started um, oh, several years ago with oh, probably actually over 10 years ago before it even started with fish. It started with what do these fish need uh, to survive in Big Cypress Bayou and Cattle Lake. Um, they used to be here, uh, but um, through uh, the installation of the dam at Lake of the Pines that, that kind of changed how the, how the river flowed, the natural flow mm -hmm. of the river, uh, plus probably some overfishing in the past really resulted in the paddlefish kind of um, going away from this system. Sure. So we looked at, you know, what can we do to get them back? One of the things is, uh, can we create a more natural flow in the river? So mm -hmm. working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Northeast Texas Municipal Water District sure. came up with this plan to have these timed releases of a certain amount of water sure. throughout the year that would mimic more of a, a natural river system. Okay. Um, that plus uh, the Corps of Engineers also uh, did a project upstream of Jefferson where they installed uh, a lot of uh, gravel substrate, mm -hmm. which is the preferred spawning substrate for paddlefish. Substrate, what is that mean? Substrate, that's, so that's the bottom of the river. Oh, okay. You know, so paddlefish like to um, spread their, their eggs mm -hmm. over those types of areas. The eggs will settle down into the, into the gravel sure. uh, where they hatch before they swim up. So what happens is when, uh, so when when a dam goes in and it restricts the flow of water, mm -hmm. um, the water doesn't flow as much in the river, so it doesn't carry a lot of sediment downstream. Sure. So all that sediment, those little fine particles, settle down onto the to these gravel substrates onto the bottom of the, the lake and kind of cover them up. So fish lose that important. Um, aspect of their spawning habitat. Okay. So now that we created this situation where we're going to have better flows, we've got some better habitat. So then it was time to put some some fish in. So reintroduce them. Uh, reintroduce the fish. Okay. And it started small. Mm -hmm. it started with uh, a concern that, well, if we put them in, they'd go downstream over the spillway mm -hmm. at Cattle when we had high water. So we put in 47 fish that had radio transmitters that were implanted in them. Radios so, inside the fish? Yeah, you know, just a That's transmitter, cool. just, a, just a small thing inside the belly of the fish uh -huh. that would send out a little radio signal that could be detected either by a handheld receiver mm -hmm. or some stationary receivers that we had along the river and in the lake, and most importantly, down there at the spillway. Okay. Um, so we followed them for as long as the batteries would last, a little over a year. And it was determined that we didn't really lose any fish downstream. So I said, so it's a, it's a success. Fish will stay here. So let's put more fish in. Okay, and cool. we, we did that a couple times. And then we got to the point where uh, we're gonna put in, over the course of 10 years, about 10,000 fish a year. 10,000, wow. To try and build up the population to, to get to spawning size. Okay. You know, where, where these fish will be able to spawn and, and maintain themselves. 
Very so we're in the middle of that right now. Awesome. So kind of work, um, walk me through what a paddlefish is. I've been, I've been told it's prehistoric fish. A paddlefish is one of the, the oldest living species that, that's here in North America. Really? Right. They've been around since the time of the dinosaurs, actually. That's awesome. Um, and um, they're, they're very fascinating fish because um, they get pretty big. Mm -hmm. They get, um, they grow to about six feet long, weigh about 200 pounds. They, they live about 50 years old. Um, there could be a six foot, 200 pound fish in, in the lake? There could. That's awesome. There could. Um, you know, that, that's like maximum size. Right, right. Um, But they do this by eating zooplankton, which are little small mm -hmm. uh, microscopic animals that live in the water. Okay. And they eat those fish by opening their mouth and swimming through the water and catching those little microscopic animals sure. uh, on their um, gill structures, gill, uh, gill records. Cool. Um, kind of like a, when a whale swims through the water and mm -hmm. filters out the, uh, the krill in the yeah. water. The same, same type of concept. And we call them the paddlefish because they've got that big long nose with the paddle on. Yeah, it's, a, the paddles. it's actually a, a rostrum. A rostrum, and, okay. And um, very interesting thing about that is um, throughout that rostrum there are all these little tiny electroreceptors mm -hmm. where they can detect things in their environment. And it's uh, believed that they can detect the zooplankton and actually mm -hmm. specific zooplankton that they prefer to eat over another type and and really hone in on where those they have uh, a favorite food yeah they do okay. have favorite food cool uh, but yeah they, and they're they're really cool and, and they they grow pretty fast mm -hmm. um we've actually recaptured some of the early ones that we uh introduced and uh, one was already almost four feet long after just oh, uh, a few years okay very cool well, how do we uh, how do we keep these these habitats uh, healthy? How do we keep the paddlefish healthy? Are, I, I know that we've had some problems with invasive species. Uh, it's something we're constantly battling here at the lake. Um, tell me a little bit about that. So, um, invasive species uh, are a threat to our native um, ecosystems mm -hmm. here in East Texas, all of Texas, and and really throughout the United States. Um, the main problems that we're dealing with here are invasive aquatic plants, mm -hmm. uh, namely giant salvinia. Giant salvinia, okay. So giant salvinia is a floating aquatic fern from South America, and it came to the United States oh, sometime in about the mid-90s, mid probably through the water garden trade. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of things, we really don't know how invasive they're gonna be until they get here. Sure. <laughs> So, and then all of a sudden, oh no, here we go, we got this problem and it's growing out of control. What are we gonna do about it? Okay. So have you worked with the, the public, the local communities to, to kind of fight giant salvinia that it's encroaching on the lake? So when, uh, when giant salvinia first showed up in Cattle Lake in 2006, it showed up on the, on the, tech, on the, on the Louisiana side of the lake first at okay. one of the boat ramps. And there was a lot of um, lot of involvement with the community on both sides of the lake. Uh, the Greater Cattle Lake Association mm -hmm. of Texas was um, was a big cooperator in trying to to keep Salvinia uh, from coming to the Texas side. Um, we had uh, they had folks that were out there kind of patrolling the lake and uh, picking it up when they when they saw it. And, but it's just such a such an aggressive plant. Um, sure, it was just hard to do. So we need to make sure we're cleaning our boats when we get out of the water and make sure we're, we're going to those wash stations and, and not transporting it to other bodies of water. That's, that's one of the biggest things is for folks to clean, drain, and dry their boats you know, be, okay. when they're going from one, one water body to the next. Sure. You know, it, um, sometimes it's difficult if you're at a boat ramp that has giant salvinia mm -hmm. or any plants floating in the water there. Um, one of the things that we do at our office is we clean the boats as best we can, clean the trailer as best we can. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we get back to the office, before we go to another lake, we'll actually take and uh, jack the boat up off the trailer a little bit so we can power wash the, okay. the carpet on the bunks uh, between cool. between the boat and the trailer. Okay. Make sure we get everything off. Because that, that's, you know, we're dealing with uh, invasive species at one lake, uh, which is a challenge itself. Mm -hmm. We don't need it at other lakes that don't have it yet. Right, exactly. Okay. Well, um, Tim, why don't you go ahead and tell me a little bit about um, some other fishery management related topics uh, that maybe you're dealing with. Is there anything else that you think that, that we should know um, about being a, a fisheries biologist and, and TPW, what TPWD is doing in the area? Right, so um, we do have um, 
some pretty interesting projects that we've been trying to do to improve um, fisheries habitat in different uh, reservoirs around okay. the area. And um, when these reservo reservoirs were built, um, you know, sometimes 50 years or more ago, uh -huh. um, they had good habitat. They had trees that were left in the reservoir that were standing, provided really good habitat for fish. But over time, we lose that that habitat. Okay. They, they kind of, they, they get rotten and fall off and just not there anymore. Sure. Um, sometimes reservoirs aren't the best at growing aquatic plants for habitat um, because of water level fluctuations or wind action or the substrate isn't quite right. So we try and do some of those projects where we can um, installing native habitat, mm -hmm. native plants. Uh, matter of fact, at Lake Merval, uh, one of the projects that we're doing there is planting native plants in protected cages to keep um, things like fish and turtles mm -hmm. from, from eating it to, to grow. Uh, so they plants. can get established? Yeah. Okay. But another thing that we do is actually put in artificial habitat, generally uh, PVC plastic mm -hmm. type structures, either that we make out of uh, PVC pipe and um, materials like that, or some commercially available products that are meant for fish habitat. Okay. Um, and we're, we're doing that through the use of funds that are raised through our uh, conservation license plate program. That's mm -hmm. the license plate that has lar the largemouth bass on it. Okay. So. I think if uh, I'll have if, to get me one. Yeah, thirty dollars a year is I think what it costs okay. uh, for one of those license plates, and I, I believe it's twenty-two dollars of that thirty dollars comes to Parks and Wildlife to use in, okay. in fish management projects. Okay, very cool. Well, Tim, is there anything that you can think of uh, with the public uh, as far as getting involved with your communities or maybe getting involved with TPWD uh, in case? Uh, our viewers wanted to get involved with conservation. Is there anything, any any avenue that you would take? You know, I think one of the neat things is um, I've been involved uh, giving some presentations to the Master Naturalist uh, okay. group. Uh, yeah. So it's a uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife program. Um, there's different chapters throughout the state, but uh, look that up. And it's, it's a year long training program where mm -hmm. people learn all different things about uh, you know, the outdoors and, sure. and wildlife. And, uh, and then they have some volunteer opportunities and to keep their certification right. going forward. Uh, so that's been that's been neat. Uh, occasionally we'll have uh, fishing events where there may be an opportunity to, <clears throat> to help out um, kids learn how to fish. Okay. Um, uh, sometimes if we're out doing this survey, like we're out talking to uh, anglers surveying, um, doesn't take very long uh, to collect the information that we want to collect. Uh, we're happy to talk to you. And so, you know, providing that information sure. is, is giving, very important. Giving feedback, keeping that dialogue going. Sure, okay. it's just one of the one of the additional tools that we use to help sure. uh, manage these lakes for, for good fishing. Well, that's awesome. Tim, I want to thank you. Thanks for coming right. by. Thank I you, appreciate Dustin. the interview. Hey, you bet. And uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Hey, Tim, would you come on and camera on? Uh, welcome. Louisa, do we have any questions? Not yet, but I'm excited to see what comes in. So just like before, Ashley, if you have questions, drop those into the Q&A and we'll have Tim Bister share his insights. I do want to apologize for all that noise in the background. I did not, uh, didn't see that uh, as a problem when I first film the video, but it's much louder now, so. Tim, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. What's one of the, the hardest parts about um, your job? And I, I don't necessarily mean things, something that you don't like. What is probably one of the more difficult aspects of your job? You know, I would say the, the most difficult aspect is is dealing with this giant salvania because really no matter what we do in places where it's well established it will just it won't go it will never go away so it's just a, a constant um effort to to keep it at a manageable level so when we have uh, these years like we've had at cattle the last few years we've had good years where where it's been manageable but it's just always there so it's just a never-ending um never ending management strategy to, to keep it manageable. 
Miss May relate, we have a question. What are good things anglers can do to help Caddo? What are bad things we need to avoid doing? That's a good question. Um, so some good things that um, anglers that are, are bass anglers that could, could really help me out is to um, look up the, the Toyota Share Lunker program. It's a, uh, it's a parks and wildlife program where anglers can report their catches of largemouth bass that are eight pounds and, and greater. Um, when I go out and do our fish sampling, uh, we don't always um, catch the biggest fish that are out there. We do a really good job of catching smaller fish, you know, up to five, six, seven pounds. But these fish that are over eight pounds, um, they're, they're rare, but they're harder to catch with what we use to catch them. So anglers that can report uh, these catches uh, to the Sri Lanka program helps me document um, the trophy potential, uh, the big fish potential of these lakes which helps me um, request uh, bass to be stocked to, to help maintain these fisheries. Um, the bad things, um, you know, of, of course, probably some typical things, you know, don't litter and um, follow, the, follow the fish harvest regulations. Um, but one of, the, one of the biggest things is to, uh, like I said in the video, um, clean the vegetation off your boat and trailer before you go from one place to another. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we can do. So it was mentioned that fishing classes for youth were available, but what about us adult fishing challenge people? I don't know of any specific um, programs. Um, th there's, a, there's one program, it's called Becoming an Outdoor Woman, I think. I think that's a Texas Parks and Wildlife program. I don't know if they include fishing in that, um, but that could be one thing. There, um, I would check the Parks and Wildlife website to see what's available for that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know of specific programs for adults. Can you tell us about your favorite work memory? Oh, one that comes to mind right away is, um, you know, I mentioned in the video, I'm from Connecticut and uh, largemouth bass up there, you know, it, a, a 10 pound largemouth bass is super rare in Connecticut. And I get down to Texas, the land of big bass, and I'm on uh, Purtis Creek State Park Lake doing a electric fishing survey. And I'm on the front of the boat with, with a dip net and I see this big, big fish uh, down in the water. And I dip my net in there and grab the fish, bring it up into the tank. I told the guy next to me, I said, oh, I got a big one. It must be eight pounds. And um, well, once we stopped the boat and started uh, measuring and weighing the fish, well, that, that fish was over 12 pounds. It was a monster fish, F biggest bass I had ever seen. Is there a state program for reporting paddle fish catches? Uh, no, there's not a state program. Um, you know, because they're a protected species, if somebody accidentally catches one, uh, of course, it needs to be released right away. Uh, I will get a, a call or see a picture from somebody from time to time, especially in the Sabine River, where the population seems to be um, doing not, not too bad there. So I'll get incidental reports from now and then, but there's not a, uh, any kind of statewide reporting program. So we have a question, just curious, are paddlefish edible? And do you know what a grintle, G-R-E-N-T-A-L, fish is? Okay, um, paddlefish are edible. So even though they're protected in Texas, you can't eat a Texas paddlefish. Um, but uh, the state of Oklahoma has a recreational uh, fishing season for paddlefish. Um, so I think just a, a few hour drive, you could be in, in an area where you could actually catch and, and eat a paddlefish. Now, paddlefish, there's places in the country where the populations are doing fine and they, they have uh, seasons for them and, and regulations. Uh, it's just sometimes in these, um, these edges of historical ranges of uh, species is where we see 
some issues with them falling off like we have here in, in Texas in the paddlefish. Um, now the other fish, um, you know, I've heard it maybe called a grenel, um, but I, I think what you're referring to is a bowfin, uh, which is, um, it's a native fish. It looks very much like a snakehead. So a lot of times I'll get calls, uh, somebody thinks they caught a snakehead, which is a, uh, a non-native invasive species that we do not have in Texas yet. Um, but so far, uh, every every report has turned out to be a bowfin, which is which is one of uh, it's another uh, species that's been around a long, long time. Is the paddlefish related to sharks, or are they in a separate category? They're they're in a separate category, although they're similar to sharks in that they have uh, a cartilage uh, skeleton. Uh, just like sharks do, but they're, um, that's probably what, what makes them, you know, as, as closely related as possible, what but not, not in the fam same family or anything. What size population of paddlefish are you aiming for in Caddo? That's, that's a good question. I, I don't know what the number would be. Um, I think our our project leader with Fish and Wildlife Service, he'd probably have it, you know, right at the tip of his tongue and be able to tell you there's probably a, um, you know, a certain density of paddlefish that would be ideal for a reproducing population. I think we're just, we're trying to build up numbers enough to where there's enough adult fish out there to where they can, um, A, find each other during spawning season and uh, successfully spawn. And like Laura Ashley had said, um, I think I think next year is probably going to be the the key year where we really start looking for some natural reproduction. All right, looks like we got a couple more questions. First, did the winter storm a couple years ago impact the growth of giant salvinia? Yeah, that's uh, we had all hoped that it would uh, kill it all and, and get rid of all of it, but unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, it did impact it and um, it killed a lot of the plants, but there's so many areas in Caddo that um, underneath the cypress trees and where, where just enough of the salvinia is protected from those freezing temperatures to where it rebounds every year. So, um, you know, if we can have good winters, uh, you know, every winter or so that knocks the plant back to the point where it's uh, a little bit easier to keep up with uh, throughout the year, I would take that. Um, now, of course, if there was a way to get rid of it totally, that would be uh, I ideal, but that, I just don't think that's realistic. So some cold winters now and again that, that keep the abundance low, uh, that, will, that will really help. All right, last question is we're right here at 7 p.m. When is spawning season? Yeah, it's, uh, it's in the spring. Um, I think it's gonna be April, April or May when uh, there's the day, day length is just the right amount of time. And the, uh, that's when you have those spring rains that, that get the, the river flowing a little bit more. And that's what cues the paddlefish to swim upstream and, and find those spawning areas. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. We're gonna well, go ahead and, and get moving, um, get to the end of this, we're almost there. So let's go ahead and recap. Here's a cool little picture of a paddlefish. So what is a paddlefish? As Tim said, they're the oldest surviving animal species in North America. They're millions of years old. Uh, I, I saw one uh, quote that said they're older than the dinosaurs. Uh, they eat by swimming through the water with their mouth held wide open to catch that plankton. It may grow up to seven feet long and up to 200 pounds, which blows my mind. And a fun fact, uh, they have no scales, and I read that they only have one bone, which is the jaw bone. Uh, Tim, please correct me if I'm wrong. Giant salvinia. So this is, uh, this is important. Um, it's that floating aquatic fern we were talking about. It's native to Brazil, forms thick mats uh, on the water, and it blocks all the sunlight. So that reduces photosynthesis and uh, results in lower oxygen in the water. I've got a few pictures of it here so that you can see. So on the right hand side here, I've got an aerial view. And if you're looking at this from the top down, it might look uh, like it's not even a wetland at all. It might even look like it's just a grassy area uh, with some trees. Uh, this stuff 
can really choke our wetlands. Over here on the top left, you can see a close-up version of it. As I tried to paddle through some of this, I do a lot of paddling out here uh, through Big Cypress Bayou and Cattle Lake, and it is tough. Not only does it get rid of your fishing opportunities, uh, but it's hard to, to paddle through. Imagine if you were a fish and you're, you're, you're trying to, to get up to some of those bugs on the surface, it'd be very difficult. Uh, if you were a frog, hopping across might be, you know, harder. So this stuff is, is, is pretty volatile to our, our, our wetlands. Below here, we have what Tim was talking about with your boat trailer, your boats. Guys, if you can, wash those off at your, uh, at your wash stations. You pick off of it as much as you can. And there's a close-up version of it in the hands so you can get a view. So what can you do to help protect our, uh, our Texas treasure out here? Well, you're already starting. Here at this webinar, you're getting educated. Uh, I, I hope that you get outside. Here, we believe life's better outside. So that's the first step. Our wetlands are rare, um, but they need help. So anytime that you can advocate for those wetlands, please do, whether that's at your city council meetings, to your friends, uh, please advocate for them. They're, they're crucial uh, to, to not only this part of Texas, but to migratory birds, to all the, the humans and animals out here. Think about becoming a conservation champion and volunteering. So we could not do what we do in conservation without our volunteers. Uh, we have lots of Texas master naturalists, like Tim was saying. We have lots of volunteers who are park hosts. Think about volunteering. And finally, consider a career in conservation. So there are many avenues to becoming uh, uh, a person who works in conservation. I'm a park interpreter but we've just talked to a fisheries biologist and a conservationist. Uh, I know people with degrees in art who become park rangers. I know people who have degrees uh, in business administration that are park superintendents. Uh, and I know people in the trades who keep our parks running. So there's no one way to get into conservation. We need everybody we can get. So I hope that you will think about it as a career. Finally, we will open it up to any final questions if you have them. Uh, Laura Ashley is not going to be available for this, this panel, uh, the final panel. So if you have any questions, it'll be directed just towards myself or Tim. Uh, you can ask me whatever you want, uh, even up to what's your favorite color. And Louisa, if you'll let me know what questions come in, I would appreciate it. Yeah, we do have a question. Can you tell us about the beetle that has been introduced to eat the salvinia? I think that's a Tim question. Yeah, that's a, that's a question for me, for sure. So it's um, the giant salvinia weevil. Um, you know, I think everybody's probably heard of the boll weevil, that uh, the plague of cotton fields in the south. Um, so weevils are insects that, that feed on specific plant species, and giant salvinia has a, a specific weevil called the, the giant salvinia weevil um, that's native to Brazil, where giant salvinia is native to. Um, and it's gone through um, you know, rigorous testing to make sure that it's you know only only going to eat giant salvinia um, in the United States, like like many um, insect control um, species that that have been used in, in the United States. Um, so this this species it's it's raised. Uh, the great thing about Cattle Lake is how passionate people are to to help with the conservation uh, of the lake. There's actually a private group um, on Caddo called the Caddo Biocontrol Alliance. And they are raising these giant salvinia weevils and putting them out to try and help um, control the giant salvinia. Now it takes a while to build up these insect numbers. Um, so it's, um, it's more of a, a, a marathon than a race. Um, so over time, we hope that the salvinia weevil uh, numbers will build up to the point where they can uh, really control uh, the giant salvinia. Now, unfortunately, these cold winters that we talked about before, they're also not good for the, for the weevils. So we have these um, winters that knock back the salvinia and the weevils, and we kind of have to rebuild every year. So that's why uh, another part of our integrated uh, approach to manage salvinia includes herbicide spraying, and that's probably what controls most of the giant salvinia at this time.
Thank you, Tim. Uh, do we have any other questions? That's all we're showing in the Q&A. Okay, well, I wanna thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, I know Laura Ashley had to jet, but uh, thank you so much for the State Park Getaways opportunity and letting us share uh, with all of you.